Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Best of Sci-Fi, 17 Times Infinity. Great science fiction by, list of authors, we'll get to that in a minute. Edited by Groff Cronklin. Groff, Groff, Groff Cronklin. Dane reads. And, uh, yeah, this is 17 stories. Uh, this is a very short blurb, so I'll read it. 17 superb stories that go rocketing into space and out of time by the finest imaginative creators of science fiction. So I'm going to read you the list of authors and uh, titles here. They're all published alphabetically by author surname, which seems like the fairest thing to do. So we have The Simeon Problem by Hollis Alper, Strike Breaker by Isaac Asimov, Come Into My Cellar by Ray Bradbury, uh, MS... Well, it's manuscript found in a library, but written in almost like shortened internet speak by Hal Draper. Cato the Martian by Howard Fast. The Spaceman Cometh by Henry Gregor Felsen. The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster. Francis Harkins by Richard Goggin. The Day They Got Boston by Herbert Gold. AWF Unlimited by Frank Herbert. As Easy as ABC by Rudyard Kipling, as well as McDonough's Song. Uh, Silenzia by Alan Nelson. What to Do Until the Analyst Comes by Frederick Pohl. Short in the Chest by Idris Seabright. The Last of the Spode by Evelyn Smith. Never Underestimate by Theodore Sturgeon. And Brooklyn Project by William Ten. And obviously, as I say, it's uh, edited by Groff uh, Conklin. And there's uh, one thing here that I've tabbed out in his introduction. Um, and it is actually his opening paragraph here. So he says, If it were not for the rigidly established convention that all anthologies, science fictional and otherwise, must have introductions by their editors, on their theory, I suppose that if they didn't do that bit of work, they'd be collecting all those juicy dollars for practically nothing at all except reading. I would leave this volume totally unattended, for it needs no introduction whatsoever. What can one say about the infinity of possible tomorrows that is not better said by the contributors themselves? Or take your own person, dear reader. If you just let your mind wander, I'm sure you'll be able to think up a whole unwritten book full of possibilities, all highly intriguing, I am sure. So we're going to take him at that. What he does do is, um, he does what Asimov does as well, where he writes introductions to each of the stories, which I think is great because a lot of these are really fascinating. So, for example, the introduction to the simian problem here, he talks about thalidomide and um, somebody who actually sadly passed away of COVID, uh, but she used to, a lady called uh, Joan used to live on my mum's street. And she was unfortunately one of the thalidomide babies, which meant that she was born with like deformed limbs, basically. Um, and so was like heavily disabled. She could drive though, and she used to get around in a wheelchair and do gardening and stuff. Uh, she had like a custom made car for her. But anyway, introduction here. From the editor's introduction to Atom to Atom, The Revolution in Evolution, Harcourt, Harper, Harvard, Hawthorne, Holt and Horton, Inc., Nueva Boston, 1985. In preparing this collection of essential papers in the history of human mutation, from, as Norbert Huxley has rightly put it, monkey to monkey, it occurred to the editor that it might be worthwhile recalling to those with faulty memories or insufficient years the horrifying, at the time, thalidomide plague, a non-genetic but congenital catastrophe of the early 1960s. Thalidomide was a synthetic tranquilizer perfected in Germany in the late 1950s, which in the years 1961 to 1962 was found to cause gross malformations in most infants born to mothers who took the pills during the first months of pregnancy. Almost 6,000 babies from Wales to New South Wales were born with no limbs or useless limb stumps, an ironic inversion of our present calamitous situation, with our infants and young people's limbs sprouting as a result of uncontrolled atomic fallout. It is particularly ironic indeed that during the hysterical excitement over the shocking thalidomide births, the United States and the Soviet Union each conducted one of their crucial series of nuclear weapon tests that now has ended by presenting this planet with the unalterable overbalance of mutation producing isotopes in the atmosphere, leading to our present predicament. One thing mankind seems to learn always too late is that man never learns in time. So I want to read here the end of the simian problem. This is part of like a lecture essentially, in which like human beings are devolving and there we go. There is another encouraging development. As you know, our society has sponsored an expedition, the most completely staffed and equipped ever to be organised, to investigate possibilities in animal mutation. The area south of the Sahara, in the jungle regions closest to the site of the French thermonuclear explosions of 1967, the so-called dirty year, have been under close surveillance for the past two years. Colonies of apes, chimpanzees, gorillas and gibbons have been formed and ceaselessly observed. I can make public a hitherto secret staff report recent offspring in one of our gorilla colonies have shown the following characteristics. Reduction of hirsute areas, less flexible spines, higher brows, a slight enlargement of cranial capacity and... Gentlemen! Gentlemen! Editor's note, Dr. Crindle was forced to break off his remarks at this moment due to an interruption and hubbub caused by reporters leaving their seats and rushing to the doors. 
Order was not restored and the convocation was therefore adjourned for the day. So I hear from Come Into My Cellar by Ray Bradbury and uh, they get in the post, the Sylvan Glade Jumbo Giant guaranteed growth, raise them in your cellar for big profit mushrooms. Uh, that They didn't ask for, but they planted them anyway. And it reminds me of recently, there's this been this scandal because like these Chinese scammers basically have been sending seeds to people in America and people are scared to plant them in case something weird happens. Obviously nothing weird happens. And we have uh, MS Found in a Library by Hal Draper. And here we, uh, this kind of dates it to like storage capacities. From Scientific American, July 1962, an advertisement for National Cash Register Company. This new NCR development makes it possible to store the entire contents of a 400 page book on one square inch. Or put another way, documents that now require 250,000 square feet of filing space can be stored in six and a quarter square feet using a photochronic material consisting of molecules of light sensitive dyes. Very cool, although obviously I think we can do better than that now. And then in that same story we get, the position was well put indeed in a famous speech by Jezebel to the graduates of the Central Saturnian University, when he said that it was a source of great pride to him that although hardly anybody knew anything any longer, everybody now knew how to find out everything. And actually the way our brains work has been documented, it's been changing because we no longer learn things by rote because we don't need to, we can just look them up. We don't need to know 1066 Battle of Hastings. We can just say, hey Google, when was the Battle of Hastings? Okay, Cato the Martian by Howard Fast, And this is, uh, well, I'll read you the intro. The absolute final word on any foreign policy that is based on self-righteousness is found in this scarifying tale. No man, no nation, no planet is ever right enough to begin a just war. Indeed, the moral of this story is that there is no such thing as a just war. And then basically the, the Martians don't even understand the word righteous or righteousness. They don't understand the concept. And uh, the Martian, Mr. Kayeg, goes, well, que sera, sera, Mr. Kayeg sighed. What will be, will be, French. Language spoken by only a handful of people on the European continent, but very elegant. And funnily enough, I mean, I remember Sarah um, for, in French because of that song, and it helped me, helps me to remember uh, like the future tense of B. Etre is uh, present tense. We get le patriotisme et le dernier refuge d'un grelin, Mr. Kayeg observed caustically. French, a piety language. English, as a matter of fact, Mr. Erdy corrected him. Patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Samuel Johnson, I believe. I don't know, I like the French version more. And so Mr. Erdig says, I am one of those individuals who, even when they cannot hope to win an argument, get some small satisfaction out of placing their thoughts upon the record. That I do not agree with Cato, you know. I have said so emphatically and on many occasions, but this is the conclusion of a long debate, not the beginning of one. So here we have uh, Richard Goggin with Francis Harkins. And this sounds about right. This happens to me when the doorbell goes. It says, the doorbell rang. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It's bad enough in the daytime, but at night it's just awful. So we've got The Day They Got Boston by Herbert Gold. The main thing to share here is probably the intro essay, uh, well, introductory notes. Who would ever have thought that anybody could make a joke out of the accidental elimination of one of the world's major cities by a nuclear bomb? The answer is that Mr. Gold has done it, and a horrifying joke it is too. Read the story with care and thought, because it must constantly be borne in mind that although the author is kidding with his words, with his ideas he is as serious as it is possible for anyone to be. The basic idea is this, will we ever, ever, ever grow up, become aware of the consequences of our acts, learn a decent reasonableness, stop playing with dangerous toys such as those involved in the infamous thoroughly amoral games theory, and finally learn the single, simple, almost silly little truism that all men are brothers? Well, we haven't figured that out yet. And then after the uh, bomb is dropped, we get, the mayor of Boston, Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic, sent a telegram to the mayor of Boston, Tennessee. Extend heartfelt regrets and sympathy to the peace-loving workers of the United States on occasion of tragic disappearance of one of its oldest cities. As American poet W. Whitman said, bar bar black sheep, let nothing you dismay. In England, anyway, it's bar bar black sheep, have you any wall? So here we have Frank Herbert with AWF Unlimited. And I think this is great. Um, because they have a Religion of the Month Club. Battlemont had joined the Religion of the Month Club almost a year ago, seduced by his own agency's deep motivation campaign, plus the Brotherhood Council's seat of approval. This month, it was the re-inspired neo Court of St. Freud. And we get an intelligent report here called Big Bertha, and uh, there's a vehicle called Big Bertha in my novel, Meat. It's also the name of a bomb, I believe. And um, we get this, which I relate to as somebody who used to work in marketing. I don't want to come back to the agency, Andre. I can't. So that's it, said Battleman. The advertising business, it bugs you. She shrugged. I'm, I just can't face another campaign. I just can't. You will write a book, announced Battleman. What? Best therapy known, said Battleman. Did it myself once. You will write about the advertising business. 
You will expose all the dirty tricks, the hypno jingles, the subvisual flicker images, the advertisers who finance textbooks to get their sell into them, the womb rooms where the use seekers are programmed, everything. And then we have As Easy As ABC by Rudyard Kipling, and in the introduction, uh, which, and bear in mind, this was published when? Um, I'm looking for the publication date of this, this anthology. Copyright 1963, and he says, uh, ignore Kipling's use of the word M-bomb. For in England in those days, it did not have the derogatory meaning it does to us today. A great quote in this, uh, you don't know what it means to work year in, year out without a spark of difference with a living soul. And a great quote here, especially uh, important in today's, you know, fake news age. But it's not true, Arna insisted. What can you do with people who don't tell facts? They're mad. So here I want to read this out at the end of Rudyard Kipling's story. We have a McDonough song. And someone's written in brackets, Mac who? Uh, and they've crossed out the words holy and replaced them with Marxist. So I'm going to read this out. But instead of saying holy, I'm going to say Marxist. So this is McDonough's song. Whether the state can loose and bind in heaven as well as on earth, if it be wiser to kill mankind before or after the birth, these are matters of high concern where state-kept schoolmen are. But Marxist state we have lived to learn endeth in Marxist war. Whether the people be led by the Lord or Lord by the loudest throat. If it be quicker to die by the sword or cheaper to die by vote. These are the things we've dealt with once and they will not rise from their grave. For Marxist people, however it runs, endeth in holy slave. Whatsoever for any cause seeketh to take or give. Power above or beyond the laws, suffer it not to live. Marxist state or Marxist king or Marxist people's will. Have no truck with the sexist thing, order the guns and kill. Saying after me, once there was the people, Terra gave it birth. Once there was the people, and it made a hell of earth. Earth arose and crushed it, listen, O ye slain. Once there was the people, it shall never be again. Okay, so senseless is crossed out and replaced with sex, uh, sexist as well. Interesting. So here we have Silenzia by Alan Nelson. And um, the idea here, I guess it's like an air whip that, that takes out sound. So uh, he says... Then I found Silenzia, beautiful, wonderful Silenzia. It was in the back room at Ziggert's, a little pawn shop off 3rd Street, while I was looking at trunks. I reached into the bottom of an old iron-bound model and came up with an airwick bottle lying under some old rags. An airwick bottle, yes, but filled with something very special indeed. A milky, opalescent fluid boiling ever so gently around some coiled copper wires. I unscrewed the lid, lifted the wick. Immediately I was surrounded with a glorious silence. The street noises, the twang of Ziggert's sales talk up front, the plink plink of a customer testing a banjo. These sounds all disappeared completely. I pushed the wick back into the bottle, the noises returned. And then we kind of see how he, um, how he uses this, I suppose. And right here, there's a footnote. So he uses the word diting, D-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, and he says, in the past, I have been accused of making up some of the unusual words that appear in my stories. Sometimes this accusation has been justified. Sometimes, as in Vulcan's dolls, see plant life of the Pacific world. It is not. For the record, therefore, be it observed that dight is a Middle English word meaning, among other things, to have intercourse with. Dight was reintroduced by a late 20th century philologist who disliked the sleep with euphemism and who saw that the language desperately needed a transitive verb that would be good usage. Good old transitive verbs. And here we have Never Underestimate by Theodore Sturgeon. Kind of troubling views here. Um, Women have always been able to get what they wanted from men by pretending to promise a thing which they know men want but will not or cannot take. Mind you, I'm not talking about situations where this yielding is the main issue. I'm talking about the infinitely greater number of occasions where yielding has nothing to do with it, like weaseling out of traffic tickets. And basically these dudes kind of create this drug that's meant to like, take over women's libidos, only it backfires and affects the men instead, so I thought that was quite interesting. And someone says, uh, there's been a woman behind most thrones all through history. The few times that hasn't been true, it's taken a woman to clean up the mess afterward. Very true. So yeah, 17 times infinity by, uh, edited by Groff Conklin. I enjoyed this a lot, it int introduced me to a lot of new sci-fi writers, people I'd heard of but never read before. It also gave me an opportunity to go back to a few, and then there's people like Rudyard Kipling, who I didn't really know wrote sci-fi. I have read some of his short stories, but nothing like the one that was in here, so that was kind of an eye-opener for me. All in all, I probably gave it a four out of five and would recommend. So there we have it, that's what I made of the best of sci-fi, 17 times infinity by Groff Conklin. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.